Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Shali. Yeah, sure. Today, I'll be presenting the case of a 56-year-old patient who presented with left-sided chest pain since one day duration. Patient was initially connected to the cardiac monitor and parallelly 10 second assessment was done. Okay. Patient was conscious, oriented and obeying commands. Airway was patent, no secretion, pooling of saliva and gurgling. On breathing, patient had a respiratory rate of 20 per minute with a saturation of 98% at room air. Okay. Air entry was bilaterally equal, normal vesicular breath sounds with adequate chest excursions. On circulation, patient had a had an heart rate of 94 per minute with a BP of 160 by 90 mm Hg. All peripheral pulses were felt and two large IVO cannulas were put. Okay. Disability, patient had a GCS of 15 by 15. Pupils were equal and reactive to light. Patient had a pain score of 7 out of 10. At this point of time, sublingual sorbitrate 5 mg was given to the patient. On exposure, patient was febrile and had a GRBS of 110 mg per deciliter. Mm -hmm. At this point of time, 12 lead ECGs were taken and the ECG showed ST elevation in V1 to V4 leads mm -hmm. and a T inversion in 1 AVL, V5 and V6. Okay. Patient was given the loading dose of aspirin 300 mg, mm -hmm. ticagrelol 180 mg and atorvostatin of 80 mg. Tropi point of care was sent and also cardiac enzyme one set was sent. Mm. Uh, and also cardio consultation was given. On screening echo was done and on screening echo there was concentric LVH, no RWMA, good LV systolic function with a grade 1 diastolic dysfunction and ejection fraction was 60%. Okay. So, uh, 60, uh, 56 year old okay. male. Okay, uh, presenting you with chest pain to the ED, left side of chest, chest pain. pain. So, uh, you will not have directly went and given a sublingual sorbitrate. Mm -hmm. You would have taken some more history, mm -hmm. which was more relevant. Uh, you felt that it is probably a cardiac pain and you have gone and given a sublingual sorbitrate. So, uh, just an evaluating an approach to a patient with chest pain. Is that what uh, we will look into? Mm -hmm. So, then he has got ST elevation, we will discuss that also. A patient coming to you with chest pain to the ED. So, how will you approach that patient? Uh, initially, you are done with your ABCD assessment. Fine, I agree to that. So, uh, when we have a chest pain to the ED, we have to think life threatening mm -hmm. and less life threatening. So, that is how we need to divide. Mm -hmm. So, we need to put our three, four differentiates. So, our history should include these key questions mm -hmm. and our evaluation should include these things also. And finally, always the risk factors. So, age, comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So, that is a major risk factors. So, this patient coming to a left side of chest pain. So, that is very clear. Uh, but what will be the classical ACS? It will be central chest heaviness. So, that is a usual classical presentation. But uh, they can come up with epigastric discomfort. They can come with syncope. They can come with giddiness. They can come with all other symptoms. They are diabetic. But uh, they can present just with a new onset arrhythmia. Then you are evaluating he is having an ST elevation MI also. That also is a possibility. So, how will you go about to a patient coming to the ED with the chest pain? Uh, initially, we asked the onset of the chest pain, whether okay. it was acute or insidious onset. <coughs> then uh, we asked uh, whether it is progressive in nature. So, uh, what are the uh, most important key questions that you said regarding onset? Sudden onset. So, sudden onset is one thing that is very important. A gradual onset one. It also can be an ACS. On top of an unstable angina or a stable angina, she is developing and uh, the patient is developing in STEMI or NSTEMI. That is a possibility. But usually when you say ST elevation MI, that will be usually a sudden onset. Maybe there will be an associated precipitating factor. So, that is a classical history that you will get. Then along with that, you will have the classical radiation of the pain and other symptoms that you need to ask in for. What are the other symptoms that Whether you Whether the have? patient is having any palpitation, is hmm. there sweating, associated sweating, is okay. there uh, exertional dyspneas on exertion. You will know that by looking at the patient's face, the patient is having probably an ACS. The fear of that impending death, death. So what we will call as the anger amni, the pain will be so much that the patient is having that he is going to die. So that sort of 
feel the patient usually might have. So that is one, maybe a group of patients with ACS, you will be able to see that. So our first one, as you said, is the ACS and always keep in your mind, in diabetic, the presentations can vary. They can present with a typical presentation to the ED. So one, done. Next one. Respiratory causes can be there. Patient can present with breath, breathing difficulty. Let's finish off the cardiac causes first. Life threatening rather than the cardiac cause, life threatening the most one is ACS. ACS. And once we diagnose ACS, the next thing that we need to keep in your mind whether whether the patient has set into any of the complications of ACS. Mm -hmm. So whether there is any arrhythmia, whether there is any failure. So these are the another two questions that we need to ask. How is the hemodynamic status? So that will come to that when we discuss ACS. So the next differential, what do you need to give? Life threatening. It should be life threatening. That should be a top two, three differential that you should always keep in your mind. Then, tamponade can be there. Cardiac tamponade just presenting with chest pain yes. unlikely. Cardiac tamponade they will have associated some gradual worsening and they will it might be a trauma history or something or maybe a malignancy ongoing treatment with chemotherapy coming to you is a possibility so that is the other thing that you need to keep in your mind the next thing myocarditis pericarditis life threatening life threatening pulmonary, pulmonary embolism so the next one you have to keep in your mind is here pulmonary embolism so definitely looking at the risk factors of pulmonary embolism and definitely they might not give you a classical chest pain history but there might be some chest pain associated with breathlessness unexplained breathlessness unexplained tachycardia always keep one of the differential as pulmonary embolism Next one. Aortic aneurysm. Dissection. Dissection. Your acute aortic syndromes. Yes. Your aortic aortic syndrome, you have three. One is your aortic yes. dissection. Yes. Then you have the aneurysm. And Absolutely. then you have the thrombus. Yes. Acute thrombus that is forming inside the aorta. So, these three together we will call it as acute aortic syndrome. So, acute aortic syndrome, these three will be the most common differential that you need to keep in your mind. Then, then what are the other life threatening a pneumothorax a young chap that is coming to the ed with the sudden onset of chest pain uh, maybe while deep inspiration or something a spontaneous pneumothorax a young patient usually that will be a young patient or it can be a copd patient who is on inhalers and all though and sudden onset but usually the presentation will vary a little bit so these are the top differentials that you need to keep well, what we can call as life threatening ones that you need to understand when a patient is coming to chest pain in the ED. So, you need to differentiate. So, here the patient has come, you have uh, taken a history and you thought it is probably an acute coronary syndrome and you have given a sublingual sorbitrate. So, by giving sublingual sorbitrate, it can help the patient to decrease the pain and as well as it is a diagnostic tool also. So, that is one important tool. 5 milligram of sublingual sorbitrate if you are giving a patient. The patient is complaining that the symptoms have relieved. So, the patient is telling, okay, she is comfortable after the sorbitrate. It can possibly two differential diagnoses you can keep. is One is ACS and, and other is esophageal spasm. So, sometimes esophageal spasm can also be relieved by nitrate. So, then you need to evaluate them further. But if they are saying it is not relieved by sublingual sorbitrate, then you need to look for what are the other causes. What are the other causes? You can accept these two. You can think of the other possible causes depending upon the presentation and risk factors. Okay. So now uh, you have uh, seen this patient. We have come to this patient. You have given sorbitrate. What all things can happen to your airway with an MI? What are the problems that you anticipate in an airway? Issues in the airway. <coughs> In airway, the patient can uh, go into spasms due to... No, airway problems that you anticipate in this patient. Normally, you don't see any. Actually, they will not have any major issues unless and until they are going for a complication. So, there can be frothing of sputum. Lot of frothy secretions can come in. So, somebody is coming with chest pain and there are a lot of frothy secretions inside the mouth thinking that he has already gone for a cardiac okay. failure. So, that is the airway major issues that you need to anticipate in this patient or any patient that is suspecting of the ACS. So, airway, breathing again. Your oxygenation uh, might be an issue. There can be a type 1 respiratory failure to start off with, then later on to a type 2 respiratory failure. And always, always remember to auscultate the posterior aspect of the chest. Posterior lower half of the chest you need to auscultate because that is the area where the fluid acclimation starts first and you will be able to get the crepitations first. So, okay, uh, tell me about Kilip's classification. 
Killip's so, classification is uh, done basically in ACS uh, okay. syndrome people to know the mortality <laughs> okay. and to progression to the cardiac failure can be assessed. Okay. In grade 1, there is no pulmonary edema. Okay. Grade 2, 50 percentage pulmonary edema is present. Okay. Grade 3, there is severe pulmonary edema. And in grade 4, they go to hypotension, uh, tachycardia and okay. then into cardiac failure. So, cardiogenic shock. So, uh, when you auscultate the patient on grade 1, you will just get carpitation in the posterior okay. lower basal aspects. So, that is the one. And half of the lungs you will be able to auscultate in grade 2 and grade 3 throughout the lungs you will be able to auscultate and grade 4 there is throughout grade 3 plus hypotension that is cardiogenic shock. So, uh, basically that is a from breathing that is how we came into Killips classification. Now, coming to the next thing uh, whom all you need to start on oxygen in ACS. Previously when we are learning oxygen uh, we are, we are when we are learning ACS it was told that give oxygen for all the patients with chest pain. So, now that is not the criteria. Whenever there is hypoxia, whenever there is hypoxia of as shown by SpO2 less than 95 percentage, you start on O2. So, all patients with chest pain does not need O2, especially ACS. So, coming to the next one, circulation. So, what are the issues that you anticipate for a patient with uh, uh, ACS in circulation? So, two things, parameters, hypertension and hypotension or normal blood pressure, tachycardia, bradycardia or normal heart rate. So, first come, uh, let us discuss tachycardia. Why you can have tachycardia? Patient can go into hypertension and then... Tachycardia, tachycardia, reason for tachycardia. Arrhythmias can be... Before that arrhythmia, most common reason? Anxiety, anxiety and pain. So, most commonly you might see tachycardia and as you said, the patient can have any arrhythmia, narrow complex or wide complex, most commonly wide complex tachycardia the patient can have. The next thing, bradycardia, why they should develop bradycardia in uh, ACS? Due to infarction, inferior volume, they can have... Okay, no, I will be more specific whenever there is an SA node dysfunction. Okay. So, whenever uh, you are uh, taking an ECG, if the patient is having an inferior volume, MI. So, inferior volume means what? It is not exactly RV. It is, can be inferior volume of your left ventricle also. When you have to see that whether there is an RV infarction, you need to take a right-sided ECG. And the next important question is that whether it is LCX dominant or RCA dominant. So, majority of the patient can have RCA dominant and few patients can have LCX dominant supply to the SA node. So, maybe 60 to 70 percentage can have RCA uh, supplying the SA node and other group of patients can have LCX supplying the SA node. So, if there is an SA node dysfunction, that means this patient can have bradycardia, heart blocks and all those things, then you need to think that the culprit vessel, probably RCA occlusion, if there is an inferior wall MI, we cannot 100% say it is the RCA. If it is LCX dominant, the lesion can be on the LCS also. So, by looking at the ECG, we can say where exactly is the culprit vessel. So, that is next. So, uh, coming to brady and tachycardia, the next thing is hypotension. Hypotension as evident, it can go for cardiogenic shock and most commonly we see hypertension. So, hypertension, how will you manage hypertension in ACS? We can give rate limiting drugs like Hypertension, hypertension. How will you manage? The drug of choice is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is the drug of choice. Nitroglycerin is the drug of choice. Remember, any AC, anything related to cardiac arrhythmias or uh, cardiac issues, if you have hypertension, nitroglycerin is the drug of choice, followed by which is the next drug, sodium nitroglycerin. So, that is the usual pattern that you need to remember. So, you can start on NTG infusion. Overall, you will not start NTG infusion. We have discussed it last. Just having sil taking sildenafil okay. and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic obstructive but cardiomyopathy. Okay. Aortic, Aortic stenosis, stenosis, we have to be cautious. And in MI? MI in in, in, in RV, RV infarction. infarction. Whenever you are having RV infarction, you will try to avoid nitrates. So, why? Because again the venous return will decrease and further hypotension will worsen. So, the treatment for hypotension for RV infarction is what? It is so IV fluids. So, that is your A, B and C. D, obviously, altered sensorium, we are having a patient with ACS. We are having altered sensorium. What do you will suspect? Unstable. Unstable, okay. You are having an unstable arrhythmia, you can think of then. Then. Hypoxia, okay, then. Can it be an embolic stroke? Yes, it can be an embolic stroke. So, always keep that in mind. ACS with altered sensorium or any focal neurological deficit can be an embolic stroke associated with ACS. So, that is the ABCD assessment. Now, you have taken an ECG and you have found out that there is an ST segment elevation from V1 to V4. So, what is the vessel that is involved? Uh, left. 
coronary artery basically b1 uh, septal walls are supplied by the left uh, anterior descending mm. and the uh, uh, anterior walls are supplied by the left circumflex okay so circumflex so there is a left coronary disease so uh, avr how was it the avr avr elevation was there no no, no avr is if there is avr elevation what does that mean Right. It's the left coronary, main coronary, left main coronary, very proximal is the lesion. So that is the advantage. If the very proximal is the lesion, it's a very critical stenosis. So AVR ST elevation also we need to look in for. So here the patient is having V1 to V4, so androceptal MI is what this patient is having. Maybe a proximal LAD lesion is that is causing these issues. And maybe the left circumflex is spared. So that is the lateral walls are spared and uh, RC is also free of disease at present. We are not seeing an infarction because if RCA is again involved, then it will be a different uh, picture. So, you have taken an ECG, you have given your antiplatelet. So, a patient has come to the ED with chest pain and you have diagnosed as an acute coronary syndrome and ST elevation MI. What are the things that you need to do? Use antiplatelets. You have given your antiplatelets. The recommended ones are right now, if you are planning for a PCA, it is tacagrelol with your aspirin. If tacagrelol, if you don't have tacagrelol, you can do with clopidogrel also. So, uh, clopidogrel again 300 to 600 mg you can give. That is high dose of clopidogrel. If you don't have tacagrelol, you can give. Still, clopidogrel can be given. So, uh, previously and all, tacagrelol, last 5-6 years only tacagrelol has come. Before that, it was uh, clopidogrel. So, these are the two agents. So, uh, the next important thing is that statins you have given and whether you need to give beta blockers or not. Routinely, immediately not needed unless and until you are having an arrhythmia to do with, then you can give a beta blocker. Otherwise, it is not required. You can continue the management and then the decision comes whether you need to go ahead and do the thrombolysis versus your primary coronary intervention. So, preferably there are centers now where you can have a door to needle time of what? 90 minutes. 90 minutes you can go ahead with PCA. If the roll to needle time is getting delayed more than 90 minutes, you think that there is a center which is very far away, you can still go ahead and thrombolyze the patient with streptokinase, altiplase or any other drug. Streptokinase 2500 rupees, altiplase 1 lakh rupees. So that is the difference. But the results are better with antiplase or altiplase because the flow that is going to you are going to get after your uh, thrombolysis is better as compared with your streptokinase. But uh, if you don't have anything, still streptokinase Streptokinase can be given, uh, 2.5 lakh international units can be given or 1.5 to 2.5, there are two uh, prescribed doses, you can give head and uh, give streptokinase. Then, what else you want to do? PCA. If the patient is preparing for PCA, what are the other additional drugs that you need to give? Decagrelol is given. All the additional drugs. There are two other in drugs that we commonly use. What is it? GP? GP23BA GP inhibitors, integralin, triophiban. These are all the drugs that you need to use. So, these drugs are usually indicated when you are planning for PCA. Routinely, you don't need this drug. So, when after along with the PCA, this drug may be needs to use. Your triophiban, these are the most common drug, integralin and these are the drugs that you need to do. GP23BA inhibitors. When you look into the total uh, platelet action. So, one is your aspirin, you are given clopidogrel and the other one that has got an effect on your antiplatelet accumulation is your GP to the inhibitors and immediately after maybe PCA, we need to plus or minus depending upon the bleeding factors, you need to start the patient on heparin also. So, when you are planning for thrombolysis or when you are planning for a PCA, immediately you don't need a heparin to be given, maybe later that you need to give. But that it's not true for your NSTEMI, where NSTEMI you can to give a uh, and uh, sorry, heparin very early. Uh, unstable angina, you want to give heparin? Unstable angina, you want to give heparin? Routinely, it's not required, but uh, if you have doubt in your mind whether it's an unstable angina or instemi, whether it's a borderline case, you can still give off heparin. Basically, for your DVT prophylaxis, also you can give heparin. So, that is regarding the other drugs. Now, what are the expected complications from your ACS? You can have mechanical complications, you can have uh, other complications. So, what are the common complications immediately that you need to look in for? Patient can go for cardiac failure. Cardiac failure? Uh, arrhythmia. arrhythmia okay. Then, then cardiogenic shock. shock. Then, uh, ventricular yeah, septal, septal rupture. rupture. Then, then definitely, then reperfusion injuries. Okay, that is after your this thing. Then, that we might not say it as a complication. You can have reperfusion injuries, yes, then? AK due to the... AK due to the drug, the, maybe after few days. 
what are the expected complications what is dressler syndrome post mi chest pain the patient can what is lv aneurysm the patient is coming to you after like 2 3 weeks and you are taking the ecg still there is st elevation that is persisting so then you have to think of lv aneurysm because that aneurysm is still there and as a result the st is still elevated so that is the other complication that you need to anticipate then <coughs> initially itself mitral acute mr acute mr you can have acute mr the initial phase itself so how will you differentiate between acute mr and a rheumatic rheumatic fever mr mr there will be certain changes mr quality you need to differentiate and an acute mr you will be able to clear it early hear it because the valve might be calcified and all but uh, sorry sorry not in rheumatic mr you will be able to uh, get a clear mr because of the calcified valve or never sometime but in an acute mr you might not be able to clearly hear the mr of what is the mr for mr pan systolic murmur so sometimes whenever you have a pan systolic murmur in an ecg patient you have to remember two whether it is a ventricular septal rupture or it is an acute mr so these are the two things that uh, you wanted to keep in your mind so what are the other things that you will do after 24 to 48 hours starting the patient on a antiplatelet dual antiplatelet okay that already done then ac inhibitors or arbs or and a beta blocker so these are the drugs that will help for the remodeling of the heart and remodeling and statins you need to continue preferably how long you need to continue dual antiplatelets one, one year. year and after that you can make into single Same antiplatelet 75 mg to 150 mg of aspirin depending upon the risk factor do we need any oral anticoagulation agent for acs as such no it is not recommended unless and until there is a patient is having associated atrial fibrillation and the risk factor so in a nutshell how we have discussed this when a patient coming to the er with chest pain how you need to approach what are the most common differential diagnosis life threatening ones differentiate between each one of this and when you have an st elevation mi in a brief how to manage is what you have discussed you have anything else to add any topics that we have missed this is a overview of an acs so that's it okay thank you